and uh, dear colleagues. Yeah, I'm from Munich and uh, actually there's the biggest beer study ongoing and uh, I just want to present you some of the results from our group and uh, I want to go from the animals just to the humans and uh, I'm going to present you some of our data. So uh, the presenter, it doesn't work. Is it possible? Okay, so these are my topics of the talk. First of all, I want to show you the effects of prolonged and strenuous exercise, and this is also the rationale why we examined it within uh, the effects of non-alcoholic beer within athletes, and uh, there you see that it's a pretty good model of the inflammation-associated illnesses like atherosclerosis or also diabetes mellitus, and therefore we're gonna have a look also at the inflammation and the infection risk but also I have a short look at the cardiovascular system and then I'm gonna show you the effects of polyphenols in beer. We use the non-alcoholic beer because in athletes it's difficult to use beer during sports and therefore we used only the non-alcoholic one and therefore we also can uh, put any conclusions in uh, respect to the polyphenols and there I'm gonna show you just the effects regarding inflammation and infection and also the cardiovascular effects. We know that the prolonged and strenuous exercise leads to a sudden increase of IL-6 immediately post-race. This is also from the former study. It's here. This was directly post-race 200 meters after the finish line of the marathon runners. You see about 100 healthy marathon runners with an age a little bit higher than 40 years. So it's the typical marathon runner on the world. It's not the elite runner, but also not the 60-year-olds, but it's a recreational runner and leisure time runner. And there you see a, sh a sharp increase in IL-6 and then also a sharp decrease. So you can argue that IL-6 is not only uh, pro-inflammatory but also anti-inflammatory. Therefore, we also examined C-reactive protein and there you see, as we expected it from the clinical point of view, that there is an increase in CRP also 24 hours delayed as we expected also in a clinical setting. So this is a typical pro-inflammatory approach after the exercise, after the prolonged exercise. And this isn't only measuring of, yeah, sometimes it's boring only to measure laboratory parameters. It's only, we all, uh, also wanted to measure some clinical endpoints and therefore we had a look at the uh, risk of infections of the upper respiratory tract system and there you see, this here is the race day, and there you see there's an increase in uh, runners with a uh, respiratory tract infection up to the fifth day after the race, and then there's a second peak within eight to nine days post-race. So this is typical what we call the open window after strenuous and prolonged exercise, and there the risk to get uh, ill after the race is here increased. And so we use this also for a model to get someone who is healthy just to an uh, illness state. And um, this is also described by the group of David Neiman, who is also one of the researchers uh, we collaborate with. And there you see the J form of the curve, which was already mentioned in the talks before. To less isn't so good as a moderate exercise, but too much of exercise is also not good. So you see the J form on, I think, or we think that marathon running is for sure here just on the right hand side of the J curve. So it's not beneficial, it's harmful. And we use the marathon runners just for our model. And uh, this is also another topic we see that there's an increase in troponin, cardiac troponin T. And this is a typical biomarker indicating uh, myocardial damage. Everyone knows from you who is in the clinic about acute myocardial infarction. And uh, there you see also a steep increase immediately after the race, but also a steep decrease. And you see this is the normal reference limit. And above this reference limit, normally the diagnosis of a acute myocardial infarction can be drawn. And um, there you see it's about 80% were above 
this limit. And um, yeah, if you go to the clinic and with such a uh, increase, then you will get a cap and uh, perhaps they're gonna have a look at your coronary arteries. And there are different mechanisms underlying and they are discussed and they are the two most important ones of this increase in troponin. First of all, the oxidative stress and also inflammation. So this is like a kind of inflammatory cardiomyopathy, uh, like you can see it also during sepsis or severe illnesses. Then the other one is the injury of the myocytes directly. We don't know at the moment whether it's reversible or irreversible in like apoptosis or necrosis. So in some athletes, in the older ones, in the veterans, we see that they also have an increased area of scar within their heart. So this might be also irreversible and I think the other two points, they are less important. But let's have a look at the oxidative stress and also the inflammation because we think that this might be one of the keys to get the phenomenon um, evaluated. And also the ischemia and uh, I'm gonna show you why. So this is the total daily intake of polyphenols and uh, normally it's measured within gallic acid equivalents and this was one study I found, I was pretty surprised because it is so low. In Brazil, it's only 50 milligrams per day. So this is amazingly low. I think these are the correct data about 800 to one gram, 800 milligrams to one gram per day. So it's an average of 800 to 900 milligrams per day. Here you can see the other um, food stuff and it's this one serving and if you compare it to beer, then it's pretty similar. It's about what you told us before, but there's also a difference. Someone asked in the talks before if there's a difference between alcoholic beer and non-alcoholic beer, and yes, there is a difference. These are the values for the alcoholic beer, and in the non-alcoholic beer, it's a little bit lower, and I'm gonna show you also the data regarding non-alcoholic beer. Why using polyphenols for infections? This is also a work from David, and uh, they examined the effect of quercetin in a very huge group. It's about 1,000 participants with a wide age, of, uh, wide age range, and uh, there were two doses versus placebo, and uh, during 12 weeks supplementation, and then they had a look at the total cohort, and they don't see any differences between the groups. There you see number of sick days, totally the same. The severity of the illness, totally the same and the same for the symptoms. So there aren't any effects of polyphenols. But when you look at the older ones, sorry for the ones above 40, and it's the middle-aged and the older ones, and, uh, and also the one who rated themselves to be fitter than the others, and there you see an effect that the um, illness days, they were significantly reduced, but also the severity, it was significantly reduced compared to placebo. The median dose was in between, the 500 milligrams of quercetin was in between, and uh, so they concluded that for all subjects combined, there was no effect. However, there was an effect for the middle-aged and older ones and for the fitter ones. And uh, this is what we also gonna evaluate within the study with the marathon runners. Then there was another trial from David and uh, there we, they examined in nearly 40 cyclists the effect of a supplementation with quercetin versus the combination of quercetin and epigallocatechin versus placebo for 14 days. I think also the loading period is very important because there's accumulation of the polyphenols within the days. And uh, there, they found, uh, there they examined also, it's a, it was a time trial. First of all, three hours of constant uh, cycling and then 20 minutes time trials. And then they're gonna examine also the pro-inflammatory parameters. And you see that the combination here and here of uh, quercetin plus EGCG was significantly uh, reduced after the race when looking at C-reactive protein, but also when looking at IL-6. 
So the anti-inflammatory effects of the combination of the two polyphenols were much more pronounced. This might be due to the uh, changes in metabolism like, and also the uptake in the colon, but also metabolism in the liver. And uh, therefore we decided us to use a mixture of polyphenols in our trial. So this was the BMAGIC trial. And BMAGIC is the acronym for Beer Marathon Genetics Inflammation and the Cardiovascular System. And uh, there we examined 277 marathon runners, marathon runners as a model for inflammation associated diseases. And uh, we gave them a mixture of polyphenols. One was the non-alcoholic beer. It was about 33 milligrams GAE per 100 grams and compared it to placebo. And the placebo was exactly the same with exception for the polyphenols. And also the taste, the foaming and the color was pretty the same. So it was a double blinded trial. And here you see the composition of the polyphenols. It was a wide range. It wasn't only xanthohumalol and isoxanthohumalol, but it was a wide, wide range. So it might be also a little bit different from non-alcoholic beer to alcoholic beer. And uh, therefore you see the mixture, we think it's also pretty important. And this was a uh, randomization. It was a one-to-one -one randomization and the intervention group, they had to drink at least one to 1.5 liter of the non-alcoholic beer per day. This were at least 330 milligrams of polyphenols per day. And the control group, they had the same amount of beverage, but without the polyphenols. We conducted this study within October 2009. And when you hear October, the marathon is at the second weekend of October. And you see the supplementation was the three weeks before the marathon. And when you know that the Oktoberfest is from mid of September to uh, just to the first weekend in October, then it was pretty hard to convince the marathon runners not to go to the Oktoberfest and to drink beer in their leisure time, <laughs> but to adhere to the study protocol. And uh, so we don't have any biasing factors. And uh, there you see five weeks before there was the in and exclusion criteria. Then in the week before there was an extensive baseline evaluation also with regard to anthropometry, ECG, um, blood draws, echocardiography, and also the vasculature. And then there was in the next examination immediately after the race, 200 meters after the finish line, then 24 hours and three days post-race. And then we analyzed several subsets. The full analysis set were all the runners finishing marath uh, the marathon uh, successfully and the per protocol group are the ones who uh, drank a lot or at least one liter of the study beverage and about the 330 milligrams of polyphenols. So these are the baseline characteristics that drank pretty much. When you look at here at the amount, so it's study beverage, the uh, mean was about 1.2 liter. And uh, so there were no differences between the intervention group and the control group. Also regarding the other baseline parameters, there was no difference between the two groups. And uh, when you look also at the other data, so this is the typical leisure time marathon runner. And, uh, but we also had some quick ones with two hours and 50 finishing time and also a slow one. And here's a slow one with nearly five and a half hour. So these were the results regarding inflammation. Here you see first IL-6, and there you see there was a significant dif difference between the two groups with a not so pronounced increase within the um, beer room, within the beer group. And this was also seen within the leukocytes. There you see, if you have a look here at all the parameters post-race, the values of the po uh, placebo group, they were significantly higher than in the uh, non-alcoholic beer group. But we uh, also looked at the clinical endpoint of the infection rate, and uh, there you see within the placebo group, it was similar to the uh, values I described you before. And when you have a look at the virum group, at the polyphenol group, there wasn't any 
real increase in uh, infections post-race and the peak about four to five days post-race wasn't seen within that group. So this was significantly uh, positive and beneficial for the VRAM group. So these were, these were the results to the inflammation and infection and these are pretty new results also on the same cohort and we also examined the troponin T within this group and uh, when you look at the increase there's also a steep increase from pre-race to immediately post-race but you, when you look at the decreased post-race so you see it's 4.7 fold within the uh, polyphenol group and it was only uh, 3.8 fold within the uh, placebo group resulting in also a significant difference within three days after. So there might be also beneficial effects regarding the recovery of the heart. Perhaps this is also inflammation associated because the inflammation was reduced and therefore also the, uh, the uh, neg negative effects to the uh, myocardiocytes were reduced. And we also examined the aggregation of the platelets. And uh, here you see, this is the spontaneous platelet aggregation. A lot of uh, the, uh, those of you who work also in the CAS labs, it was used with the uh, multi-plate assay. And there you see within the placebo group, there was a steep increase post-race. This is also as we expected it due to oxidative stress after the marathon and also inflammation and uh, increase in catecholamines. And there you see within the VRM group, the polyphenol group, there was no increase and there it was nearly stable. If you know that the ones who were a little bit older have perhaps a little bit of atherosclerosis and might be also have a blood rupture and then if there's an activation of the uh, platelets, this might be leading to a clot and then there's an acute myocardial infarction. And therefore, this is the most important thing that polyphenols in non-alcoholic beer, so we think it's not the effects of alcohol we saw, but only of the polyphenols. They have anti-inflammatory effects and they, they, seem to uh, they seem to decrease the risk of infection of the upper respiratory tract system. This also seems to be linked to enhanced cardiomyocyte recovery after the stress and might be also have positive effects of the platelets and also of the platelet aggregation and the thrombocytes. And therefore this is from the 50s. It's a sign which called uh, beer is good, says your physician. And perhaps, yeah, this is a little bit of truth in it. And uh, I wanna thank all of our colleagues and uh, the head of our department, the working group, and uh, a lot of them are actually at the reason at the Oktoberfest, and they try the next study, and yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>